So, um, yes, great. So we're going to move on to the next talk uh, with Chris Santoro. And uh, Chris is the engineering lead at Sound Toys in Burlington, Vermont, and he's been developing audio effects plugins for over a decade. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in computer engineering from the University of Florida and a master's degree in music engineering from the University of Miami. Uh, and yes, thank you very much for joining us, Chris. It's, uh, it's great to see you. And um, yes, we hope you're having a good time in um, sunny Vermont. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've had a couple sunny days here recently, but um, yeah, it's uh, the average temperature temperature has been about 20 Fahrenheit. And so it's uh, that time in the winter. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, there's so much that we could talk about. I guess, I guess maybe one place where we could start is kind of the beginning. Uh, what, what got you into audio software development and, and curious about uh, wanting to develop audio plugins? Um, well, I think my story is not too different from probably most people's story. Um, uh, most people start out getting interested in music, right? And um, in uh, like elementary school, we would do like group reading in class. And um, I really hated having to listen to people read aloud. Like I really didn't like it. And so one way you could get out of that was um, to go do violin at that time. So I said, oh, that sounds cool. So I learned to play violin uh, in elementary school and then um, uh, kind of loved it and um, started moved over to cello and uh, music is kind of something that stuck with me my whole life. But um, by the time I was in um, high school, I started to get interested in computers. And um, some of that is through, um, you know, through video games um, and uh, really interested in um, multimedia technology and how computers and computer technology can, um, you know, create these, um, great creative experiences. Um, and, uh, the first doll that I used was reason. Um, and I, it blew my mind. I thought it was so cool. Um, uh, you know, using that in the, you know, late nineties, maybe around the year 2000, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so by the time I went to college, I knew I kind of wanted to work with like, um, you know, multimedia technology, signal processing and, Actually, at first, I was going to go for a degree called um, Digital Arts and Sciences, which is kind of like a half art degree. Um, but then I decided um, I was also attracted to like knowing how things work down to the most fundamental level. So I decided to study computer hardware um, because it's that's just always been something about the way I approach things. It's like I need to know it all the way down to you know, almost the atomic level. Uh, there can't be like any mysteries in the stack. So um, did um, computer hardware and electronics at the University of Florida and then kind of touched a bit on signal processing there. And I had a job um, in a lab where um, I worked on radar. Um, so a little embedded system, Texas Instruments, DSP. Um, and we did, we, we wrote algorithms that um, process radar signals for like defense stuff. And um, that was pretty neat, but um, I, defense wasn't like kind of where I, I wanted to be. I wanted to be in something a little bit more um, artistic and creative. And uh, so for our senior design project, um, I did a guitar pedal like on an analog devices um, development board um, with a friend of mine who was also interested in audio. And he was from um, the Miami area. And he told me about the program at the University of Miami, uh, music engineering technology. And um, so I decided to apply and uh, I went there and it was, um, it was great. It was, um, it's in the music school, it's not in the engineering school. And that was something that appealed a lot to me. Um, it, uh, and so you're around musicians and music 24 seven and around people who are interested in that all the time. And so it was really great to be immersed in that. Um, and then, um, after Miami, I did an internship at Sure, um, the microphone company in Chicago. That was really great. And um, the then the economy collapsed. And so I think had that not happened, I probably would have ended up getting hired at Sure. Uh, they wanted to bring me back as an intern again. 
and um, because they didn't have a job rec at that time. And um, then I heard through the grapevine from somebody who knew about Sound Toys um, about the opportunity there. And um, it sounded really cool because, you know, going back to my experiences with Reason, um, making plugins was always something that like would have been my kind of like my dream job. So um, I got hired and I've been there since, you know, 2009. So it's been a fun, a fun ride. That's great. And uh, so you said that you went to the University of Miami and we've had so many people or I've I've met so many people through my travels that have uh, that are alumni from there. We have Brett Porter, who gave a talk last year on uh, MIDI 2 spec. Uh, Jay Coggin, who used to work at Apple. He's a amazing uh, engineer. Uh, and there are loads of others that uh, I can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, but you have the uh, legendary Will Perkle, uh, who's there. He, he was one of your professors there at uh, Miami. Is that, is that right? Actually, um, that's not right. I was, I was there during the non Will Perkle years. So like Will was there like in the nineties and then he went off and worked at Korg for a while. And so late 2000s, I was there. I, um, the professors there were this guy named Corey Chang, who came from Dolby Labs, um, really brilliant guy, and Colby Leiter, who um, is kind of an electroacoustic music um, uh, expert and um, really interesting and fun guy. He works at Magic Leap now. Um, wow. So then after, and then I was there for just for a graduate degree. So it was just two years. And so Will kind of came back after that. Um, and I'm good friends with Will, but I don't know him from having ever been his student. I've just know him through that community. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's so many people, so many great um, engineers have come, have come from Miami. It's uh, it sounds like they have something in the water there for sure. <laughs> I, you know, I think what it is, is it's, it's very um, industry connected. Hmm. It's not exceedingly academic. Um, and so everything's built around, um, learning things that you can use to make real stuff and to, you know, do things that are actually useful mm -hmm. uh, rather than learning theoretical concepts from people who have, you know, never worked in the industry. Like everybody there has, has, you know, real world experience. I mean, and Will's a great person of that, like through his work at Korg and, you know, a lot of other stuff that he's done. Yeah, amazing. And big shout out to uh, Christopher Bennett, who's a professor there as well. I'm not sure if you know Chris or not. Oh, I know Chris very well. Yeah, we're both kind of from the same part of Florida. Um, so, and I was there when he was getting his PhD. So yeah, we're good friends. That's great. Yeah, Chris just came out with a book recently. Uh, I can't remember the title of it off the top of my head, but uh, it's a great book. I, uh, he actually gave me an advanced copy. So go out and get it. It's DSP and uh, MATLAB. Uh, really good book. Uh, so uh, moving on, so your uh, your time at Sound Toys, so you joined there in about 2007, you said, and um, you were telling us before the call that Sound Toys was among one of the first plugin companies that uh, ever really came out with, with audio plugins. So uh, of course you have probably even even at the time that you got there, the code base must have been, um, you know, over 10 years old. So can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you had to deal with uh, working on a legacy code base? And uh, that would have been pre-juice as well. So uh, another thing is that the plugins that you create there are, are not created in juice. They're outside of juice. So can you just talk about some of the challenges that you have to deal with uh, working outside of a cross-platform framework? Well, I, I, we actually work within a cross-platform framework, but it's one we've built ourselves. So like, like tying back into what I was saying earlier, it's kind of a, a good match for me. Like Sound Toys was a good fit for me because um, we like to understand everything top to bottom and control everything top to bottom. So. The, all the advantages of, of vertical integration, right? Is if you want to do some custom, you know, stuff that might be really weird and not apply to a whole lot of people, um, you can do it. You know, you're not really tied up. You're not limited or waiting on like any third party to implement that if you're using some kind of third party thing. Um, and the disadvantage is, you know, you have to do the work. Like you have to imp implement all those details yourself and all the, um, you know, all the neat stuff that the, the juice team takes care of for you. Um, I think if, you know, we've talked about it in the office, like if, 
SoundTwist was starting out today, like we probably use Juice. I don't know. I think it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but we've always been in the completely 100% proprietary boat. And so um, that's where I think we're going to stay because, you know, once you're in that lane, it's, it's more work than it's worth to, to get out of it. But um, yeah, so I mean, talking about a long-lived code base, like um, SoundToys was one of the first plugin companies um, writing plugins for Pro Tools in the mid 90s. So, and those plugins ran on, you know, you didn't really even have um, native plugins that ran on your computer, they ran on accelerator cards. So there was the Pro Tools TDM format, which was a fixed point um, Motorola DSP um, uh, that only high-end pros had, you know? So all the people buying those plugins were like people in big studios that made a lot of money, you know, uh, mixing records, making records usually. Um, and not like you see today where, you know, you have so many people buying plugins and making music at home and they, you know, they might be doing it professionally or they might be doing it for fun. Um, but um, yeah, I think like going back to your question, um, the, the main challenges were, you know, a lot of our framework was tied to um, being able to support the Pro Tools TDM format and native code because we only implemented VST and audio units, yeah, around 2007, I think. Um, before that, it was, you know, Pro Tools was the only place you could get um, our plugins. Um, and so decoupling from the limits, um, there were certain limitations that were kind of built into our code um, based on having the capability to run on hardware, um, things like memory limitations and how we allocated memory. So. Um, when we did a, we have a product called Effect Rack, which is all of our plugins built into one. It's kind of a, a meta, like multi effects plugin. And when we built that, um, it strained a lot of those, um, you know, those limits, like like mem like having a, a maximum amount of memory that could be allocated, um, because all of our memory is allocated in like a basically a, a one memory pool, you know for different types of things and that and that was related to um the this motorola chip and it had different it had different types of memory that um you would use for different types of things like signals or data or um that kind of stuff so that has some side effects that we have control over that like you get really good cache locality um out of your you know your data structures and all of your stuff that you're doing in dsp rather than if you were just allocating DSP data for everything separately in the, every one of your algorithms where they might be all over the, you know, uh, the place. But um, yeah, so I think, yeah, it's things like that, like um, having to have a dynamic, you know, converting to a dynamic memory pool. Um, and um, yeah, that's, I think basically it, things of that nature without going into it too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I actually, can I ask you a question or maybe just drill down into this a little bit more? Because I'm just really curious. You know how a lot of companies like Native Instruments or Ableton or others, they actually do the same thing. They have like their own cross platform frameworks that they have written before Juice was around that they're kind of committed to now and they keep maintaining. And I wonder how it is now, like for like 2021 working with a code base like that, like where, you know, a lot of people are talking about like the newest C++ standard and all the like fancy new features that we have there. Or a lot of people are talking about things like unit testing. We had, you know, several talks about that at the last ADC. And I know that these and other things can be a real challenge if you're dealing with a 20 year old code base, um, you know, because I've also worked with some of these, these places. And so I'm really curious, like what's your experience like for you? Uh, what's the experience like for that with respect to um, uh, people talking about like hot new, hot new stuff, like, uh, well, like whether, okay, let me be a bit more precise, like whether you kind of can or do like embrace these like new, like, you know, current language standards or like things like unit testing or whether you kind of um, have to like, just follow like a different strategy just because of like the code base forces you to do that. Um, I think it's it's generally pretty flexible. I mean, I think one of the things that is might be like a shock to newer developers coming in is, um, you know, 
our code is is mostly C++, just like you know almost everyone else. But um, C++ even means different things to different people depending on how old you are, right? So yeah. like ours is the older, is basically mostly pre C++ 11 C++, which is to say like it's mostly C with classes. Um, and so it's very C oriented because um, the founder of Sound Toys, Kim Bogdanovich, and um, another longtime engineer at Sound Toys, Bob Belcher, um, both of those guys came from Eventide in the 80s and 90s um, when you didn't even necessarily have C++. Um, they might have been working just with C back then. So our, our code base, I would say, is very C oriented. Um, and there's no, there's almost no standard library in it because um, standard library used to be slow um, and it used to have, um, it used to be hard to debug. Um, the tools have, as, as, since C11, it seems to me like everything's gotten a lot better. And um, you can do a lot more with that stuff now, but um, kind of just because of convention, like we have avoided um, standard library in a lot of our code. Um, and so we, we do a lot of rolling our own, you know, for, for things like that. Um, so does that include things like, you know, threads and strings and like, you know, all of these like basics? Yeah, it does include um, strings. Um, uh, not for threads. We have a, a little bit of the um, code that we've done that has involved threads and concurrency. Like we've used a little bit of um, um, threads in Unixus and things like that. Yeah, this is a practice that I've actually heard happens in some gaming companies as well, that where uh, they feel that the standard library is actually too slow to uh, for their own use, and so they roll out their own standard library <laughs> that's slow and sometimes it's just not offering like the right guarantees you know where like you have like the standard library being optimized for like you know a certain algorithm being like oh log in or whatever but what they need is like something something different from that just because of th their use case so yeah i guess i think i think like big gaming studios like uh, uh, what is it like EA or whatever they're called? Like I think they all have like their own implementations of the standard library, which are just like a tiny little bit different, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think a lot of like the old like audio companies, they have something similar going on. You know, the ones that come from the like early '90s or like early 2000s. Mm. Like I, th I think I think they probably all have the same thing going on if they ship like on multiple platforms. I would say. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, I think and and you're also right in that it's, it has the most similarity, I think, to the, the game world um, where you're running on a, and especially, again, especially the older audio companies or the ones that have been around longer, like um, the have more often would have run on esoteric platforms, you know, like um, that where you didn't really have nice um, native environments like you do now. Yeah. Have you have you ever tried to uh, create something with Juice? Have you ever tried Juice out just in your own free time? Um, I had, there's it's been on my list to do. I, I'm not really that familiar with Juice to you know to be honest, um, but it's been on my list to like take a look at it just to kind of know. I think what like um, younger engineers you know they're most likely to be familiar with Juice if they're going to start their own plugin project. So to know what like uh, what their expectations are coming in, like what are what type of environment are they, do they think they're going to see, you know? Um, but yeah. Yeah. That, that was going to be my next question. I, I imagine that having a code base like that, that there must be certain challenges for hiring, uh, hiring engineers and what they would expect to see. Have you, have you found that in your hiring when you, when you go to look for other engineers or do you feel that, you have an infrastructure where you can kind of ease them into this code base? Um, we haven't, um, we don't hire very frequently. We're very, uh, been a very small company. So, um, uh, you know, we're about 14 people and most of that is, you know, probably customer support. And um, the dev team is four or five mm -hmm. um, people. Um, so, you know, we're not, I don't think, um, again, it's not my company. It's, um, but, uh, the way I 
my take on it is we're not trying to become like a native instruments or a waves or something like that where we have a hundred people or you know more so um hiring is very infrequent um so i, I yeah i wouldn't say that's really a it's never been a problem i think like um anyone coming in as long as they know c and c plus plus like um, you can get into it and there's someone there with a lot of experience to guide you, you know, to get used to that environment. Yeah, that, that brings a great, brings up a great point, which is about the company philosophy. So you've, so this is a company that started up in the mid nineties and that at the moment you have 14 people in the company and it's interesting because a lot of companies that have started then have grown into kind of behemoths, you know, your Arturias, your native instruments. And can you talk a little bit about what the company philosophy or what the company outlook is? Uh, is it, is there a desire to stay small and kind of more of like a boutique uh, plug-in company? What, uh, what is the kind of company philosophy there? Uh, yeah. I don't know that the, there's necessarily like a desire to say stay small, but I think the the desire is like it's definitely some things I've heard. Um, you know, Ken, the founder, say is is you know there's a desire to be sustainable. Um, so if you are a company that's chasing like always growing profits, like that's not sustainable. That's also something I've heard the CEO of Ableton say, which was really nice at, at ADC uh, last year. His talk was really great. Um, and um, yeah, I think sustainability and doing um, meaningful, you know, meaningful work. So not like cranking out products just because, you know, you need a new product, like cranking out something because you think it's unique and new and fun and is going to make a dent in the, um, in the music industry and um, uh, yeah, have an effect on, you know, how music sounds. Yeah, it very- resonates a lot, definitely. Yeah, I think that's a really... Uh really healthy approach, I would say. Yeah, and we've, I will say we like, we've been fortunate to have been successful enough um, that we can take our time with things. And it can be like, it can be a little frustrating sometimes, like when, because you, you know, as a developer, you want to release products, right? Um, but um, the bar is, is really high for us. So, you know, we work on some things for a long time and, and, we even work on things that uh, a, a fair number of things that don't go out the door because we, uh, you know, they just don't, they don't meet the bar for us or they sounded like a good idea. And then they, you know, it kind of wasn't, um, you know, it just didn't meet our quality level that we were looking for, for, you know. Yeah. And can you, and can you define what that, what that is the characteristic of what makes a sound toys plugin, uh, the because of course uh, many people use it uh, use them and know them for their unique uh, concepts unique ideas can you describe where that where that stems from yeah I think uh, well that all comes from Ken um, he's like the driving force behind all that so um, and he's that's I think one of the things I like most about um, working here is he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of effects um, sound toys also has like every an incredible gear collection that I think like nobody else has. Like, I don't know if you've followed us on Instagram or, or seen things on the internet, but like um, we have, it's the Noah's Ark of gear. So like every effects box that's like ever been invented is pretty much in the sound toys basement. Like it's like, uh, so anything you want to check out to get inspired um, is there, you can go use it for real. Um, and I, so I think um, to answer your question though, the, uh, the, what makes it sound, what makes sound toys plugins unique is they are easy to use, um, but also deep. So it's this balance between, um, you know, not throwing a thousand knobs on the screen, um, but having uh, an interface that can, um, that encourages you to play with it and can of like kind of um, expose new features where you can go very deep if you want to. Um, but also I think um, making plugins that are hard to make a bad sound with. So, um, you know, that no matter what you do, you know, you're gonna get something that sounds good and interesting. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of the, 
that's the core thing to me is like balance of ease of use, um, fun to use, um, and but also like incredibly tweakable, like where you can go down to, you know, and really go out there if you want to go there. Yeah, when I was when I was producing music, Echo Boy was probably one of my top three plugins. Uh, and for that reason, because when you look at the interface initially, it's it has just a couple knobs that you can just tweak. And then if you really want to go deep, you can go the the interface leads you deeper and deeper into different types of delays. And you can actually customize those delays. You can separate the delay of the, the right side and the left side. Uh, I, I almost felt that that delay with that delay, that was the only one that I needed. I never needed another delay because it could make pretty much absolutely any sound. <laughs> right. I think, and that's our, that is um, the, maybe the like prime example of like the sound toys design philosophy. That's our goal. Like almost with every plugin would be to, to be like that, to be the one thing that you need of that, of that type, you know, um, to very thoroughly explore that, you know, that area of effects. So, um, yeah, but you, you know, it's, it's very, it takes a lot of work to do that. It takes years. Like I think uh, Echo Boy, I think, took Ken like four years to make. So um, it's, uh, if you want to make stuff on that level, like you, you can't be cranking it out every year, you know? Um, you can't crank out a product every year. If you want to do products like that, you have to take your time, um, so. Yeah, and does does Ken still code or does he really provide the vision and leave, leave the coding to the rest of the team? Oh, he definitely still codes. Um, the um, uh, I, don't, I don't think he'd be doing it um, if he wasn't still like helping create the stuff. Um, so yeah, he's definitely, you know, still very involved in the technical aspect of stuff. Amazing. Uh, so you brought up th that you have a lot of gear there at, uh, at the headquarters. And one thing that I was wondering about is just around the subject of DSP algorithms themselves, uh, do Sound Toys as a company, do you get involved in, in modeling analog uh, gear or do you, uh, do you simply use it for inspiration? Um, do you try to actively do like white box modeling or do you just uh, try to maybe approximate sound? Uh, what, if as much as you could tell, uh, <laughs> I know there's some secret sauce there that you probably can't tell us, but. Yeah. yeah, I think what I can say is, is definitely both of those things. So like the two things you said is analog modeling, like, yes, we do do that. And, um, and just simply using things for inspiration. Um, I, you know, we don't want to be seen as like a modeling company. Like um, if we did, like we could have probably done like 10 or 20 model DQs, you know, like in any time we wanted, it would be, you know, but, um, you know, we, we have restrained from doing that. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and we all, anytime we do something, we want to, we want to model it to make sure we get the sound right. But, um, but then also you want to take it further and add something new, you know, to the conversation. Um, yeah. And what, what do you feel makes a, because uh, of course, you know, now you have some DSP algorithms that you can find on uh, around the, around the interwebs, uh, and uh, of course, through books like Will Perkle's book, Eric Tarr's uh, got a great DSP book of algorithms as well. And of course, we have these kind of standard, I guess you could call them DSP algorithms uh, for making a compressor or for making a filter. What is it that you feel, how do you get into the interesting space? How do you get out of this kind of standard. So there would be like a standard space, I guess, for making a delay or making, um, you know, making a filter, I guess. How, how do you get outside of what the norm is? Is it just through experimentation or uh, what do you use to actually kind of fire those creative juices as a DSP engineer? Um, I mean, I think listening to stuff is the is first is, you know, just finding things that you, you love the sound of and then drilling down into like, why does it sound that way? Like what makes this compressor or this delay or this, you know, 
electroacoustic thing, like what makes it sound the way it does. And then you go about trying to recreate that sound like however you need to. Um, the, uh, yeah, and I think another thing about like uh, how to get outside the box is to um, not maybe like don't look at that stuff. Like if you know there's a, if you know there's a, there's other off the shelf compressor or filter designs, like, you know, maybe just try and do it without looking at that stuff. And you will naturally come up with something different. Um, if you don't let yourself be influenced by, you know, what's already there. Now, that being said, there's a, there is good reason to study what people have done before you because they probably had good reasons, you know, but, um, but that's just, that's just one thing is to not, you know, just start blazing your own path, you know, rather than. Um, yeah. And, and in terms of being a DSP engineer, so many people ask us all the time, what type of math would I need to study to really be an effective DSP engineer? Uh, I think differential equations is like, you know, maybe one of the biggest ones, linear algebra, um, also very huge. Um, and, but I think um, uh, other than just uh, oh, numerical analysis also, um, other than um, getting like out of the math realm, something I like to see in people is people who understand how computers work at a very low level. So like not just being a computer scientist that um, understands how code works, but understanding bytes and understanding fixed point and floating point DSP and understanding like how a floating point number is represented and understanding the implications of like a fixed point um, environment on your algorithm and on filter stability. And those things are, have kind of disappeared like fixed point processing. Um, and so, you know, and going back to what we were talking about earlier, like with our code base, like a lot of our um, algorithms in filtering technology, like were, you know, um, had to simultaneously run in floating and fixed point environments. Um, so there were things about the DSP code that, you know, um, were due to, um, you know, fixed point. Um, so yeah, I think in addition to math, um, you know, really knowing deeply how, how computers work and what happens to sound when it goes into your computer gets mangled up by the processor and, and comes out the other end. Amazing. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm out of questions. Uh, yeah. Don't worry, we have plenty of questions from the YouTube chat. <laughs> <laughs> Great, right on time. Uh-oh. Uh, should, I, should I start? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, we have actually two questions from Cameron Minuti. Um, and I guess those questions should be prefixed with, um, you know, if if you can at all say anything about this, which you might not be able to. Um, so the first question would be, um, how does Santos model uh, dynamic behavior in analog circuits? What sort of dynamic behavior is occurring in the decapitator? Ah, okay. So um, yeah, this is going to be one that I can't answer too much. Um, but the, um, I could tell you what, you know, decapitator is based on, um, um, you know, a bunch of tube um, amplifiers. And um, I can tell you some of the dynamic things that happen in tubes when you, when you drive them really hard, um, which is um, when you hit a tube, um, you know, really, really hard, it actually um, kind of compresses the signal. The, the transfer function of the tube um, changes you know, as you hit it. So like um, you, it, you'll kind of get um, a dynamic, a dynamic distortion. The character of this distortion changes based on the past input level of the signal. And that has to do with the circuit and how the capacitors around it um, uh, basically like charge up and change the bias points of the, um, you know, of the tube or transistor or whatever the amplifying device is. So, um, yeah, that's, um, yes, definitely dynamic behavior. I can't go into specifics of like, you know, how we modeled it. Um, I will say, you know, the thing we always say is that listening is the most important thing um, in modeling. Uh, and rather than like what type of technique you used or, or what the actual DSP is, but um, 
but yeah, there's, um, I, sorry, I can't go into more detail there. Yeah, so I guess that's going to be the answer of the second question as well, which is, does Saunders use space state or WDF modeling methods? What was the second thing? State, state space and what? State space or WDF? Oh, um, wave, di wave digital filters. Um, oh, right, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, no, we don't use any um, wave digital filter stuff. Very familiar with it. Um, it's, it's super interesting. Um, some of it's over my head even. That's, uh, but um, yeah, we don't use any of that. I've experimented with some state space stuff, um, not in filters, but um, uh, in some other things that I've experimented with. So yeah, All I right. mean, well, state, yeah. state space is comes in big in um, if you wanted to do very like literal circuit modeling, you know. All right. Well, thanks for, for some insight there. Um, Bonsembiante is asking what kinds of tools and knowledge what kind of tools and knowledge gives you a degree like yours in music engineering? I guess the question is like, uh, like, you know, you said you had, if you have like a degree in music engineering, what, like, what are the kind of tools and knowledge that you get out of it, which you then can apply to the kind of stuff that you're, you're doing? I guess that's, that's how I would interpret that. Yeah. So um, I think, uh, well, signal processing for one, um, electronics, um, acoustics, um, psychoacoustics, which is how your brain um, interprets, you know, sounds. Um, and, and then that is all blended with, um, you know, basic computer engineering stuff too. And that's kind of like how I would describe um, the music engineering degree. Um, and then also it's very focused on the recording and, and music world. All right, um, thank you. Um, we have a question from Monta Music Channel. Um, they got the full package of your plugins and they wonder if there is a chorus or flanger unit planned, uh, not phase mistress, micro shifter or crystallizer. Uh, okay, uh, uh, they're asking about a flanger? Um, about a chorus or flanger, yes. Uh, um, uh, yes, yeah, I'll just say yes. Okay. Um, yeah, we have to, if you search probably way back to like the mid 2000s, I think we might have even like um, advertised a flanger plugin that was in the works at some point, but it's definitely something we want to come back to. And, and chorus also for sure is like, would be in our wheelhouse. It's something we've been talking about for years. All right. Um, interesting question from Bon Symbiante. How do you uh, deal with uh, the sound design um, are there music producers in the team? And can you as a developer uh, like raise ideas about the sound aesthetic? Uh, yes, absolutely. So like, I think um, kind of touching back on some stuff Josh was asking about, about um, hiring people. I think one of the biggest things we look for is are people that are you know passionate about music and care about the, the aesthetic um, and care about design. Um, and um, those sort of things. And um, so everyone on our team like has that perspective where they are, they have an opinion, um, which is great. And then also like difficult sometimes because we don't <laughs> always all agree, but um, the, um, uh, yeah, I think um, we, our main sound designer is this guy named Mitch Thomas, who is um, really a um, big synth head. Um, he knows the entire history of synths. Um, he's really talented um, and he's a great preset designer. And he kind of leads like most of our, um, you know, preset uh, creation, but, um, but we all chip into that. And that's also one of my favorite things about working for a small company is that you do get to have a say in that sort of thing. And you get to have an impact on you know, on sound quality features, you know, um, all of that. That sounds like a very good place for me, uh, to me for someone, you know, someone who's a developer who also cares about sound and all of these other aspects of like what it takes to make a plugin. So sounds like yeah. you've got a good setup there. <laughs> yeah, but there's a drawback too, which is um, you don't get to focus on one thing all the time. Like sometimes like I, I fantasize about like, oh, it would be cool to work at a place maybe like uh, like Native Instruments or something where I could be a DSP engineer and just do DSP for like a couple of years, you know, but uh, so 
it's um it's a plus and a minus like you know getting to do everything means you kind of also have to do everything you can't really like stay in one little box you know Th that being said like i know a company which is not native instruments but another another big one where they don't really have people who just do DSP. And at the same time, I know like a very small company where they have someone who is doing just DSP. So it's not just the, the company size. I think it's, it's more like the team setup, the team culture, things like that. So, you know, or like the initial people who like started it and how they approach it and how it kind of grows from there. So I don't think it's necessarily the company size that kind of determines what your setup is going to be. I think it's more like, you know, the kind of the culture or like the individual people involved, or I don't know, but like that would just be my guess. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that's true. Um, so we have one more question from uh, Rebo uh, Talvatke, um, who's asking, um, since you worked at Sure as an intern, the, the microphone company, could you mention any skills that companies like that look for, say um, in an undergrad electronics student? Um, yeah, I think they, uh, yeah, it's hard for me to speak for them for like what they look for. I don't, I don't know, but um, you know, I think they probably just generally want you to be um, pretty smart. And they were, so at the time that I did an internship there, they were just um, getting into building a DSP team for wireless mic stuff, because that was around the time that um, the big like wireless spectrum changeover was happening and there was going to be a big disruption in like wireless microphone stuff. Um, so they were looking at using DSP to um, uh, kind of, um, you know, solve some of those problems. So um, yeah, so I can only really speak from that perspective. Like, um, yeah, just to, to know the fundamentals of DSP very well um, and, you know, be generally, um, pretty smart to know a good bit about embedded um, embedded systems and actual DS writing code for actual DSPs because they make real physical products um, in the world that are going to have like a analog devices or a Texas Instruments DSP or something like that in them. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I, I could chime in a little bit on that as well because I speak to a lot of companies about hiring and what and what they look for. I think what they look for uh, more than anything is just somebody who's willing to learn new things, not afraid to get their hands dirty in terms of getting into code, learning new things, being able to take something that they don't, that, that the developer doesn't know about and break it down into digestible pieces of information that, uh, and, and kind of working their way to a solution. Um, and also building stuff. Uh, there's, I, I, I can't believe how many uh, people come across uh, that, that I come across that want to uh, be plug-in developers and companies say, well, show us something that you've created, show us something that you've made. And you say, well, I haven't created anything yet. I haven't made any, I haven't made any plugins. I don't have any code that I can show you. They need to have something that they can see that you've created something that shows your ideas and, you know, your, your way of thinking. Um, yeah, I was just about to comment on that. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem with many people, isn't it? Mm. It is, it is a little bit, but I think, I mean, with the tutorials that we have, we have what over 80 tutorials, 80, 90 tutorials now on how to start building your own plugin. Uh, and, I think there's enough there to really kind of get started with something, even if it's just a delay, even if it's just a standard delay and you've, and you've done that and then you've created your, your own UI with it, just a basic UI. I think even just having that just says something about your, your mentality as a developer, you know, whether you like to uh, just have everything just kind of all in the process block or whether you'd like to write a little function, write, functions for everything. I think it just really says something about the way that you process problems and really think about them. Um, yeah, and I guess also your choice of like, do you use Juice, do you use something else? Do you use like modern C++ or not? Like how do you structure your code and things like that, right? There's a lot of stuff to look at if you're like hiring from the other perspective, you know, from the other side of the table. Yeah, they don't need, they don't need like the Mona Lisa of plugins. You know, that's not, especially when you're talking about a junior developer, they're not, 
you know, the, the bar in terms of what's expected isn't necessarily, um, you know, they're not going to expect something that they would expect from somebody like Chris, who's been in the business for a long time, but it's just showing that you've made something uh, and that you have an understanding of the basic fundamentals. And by basic fundamentals, meaning a lot of the stuff that we cover on the channel, like, uh, you know, are you um, trying to call, call to your uh, UI from your, from your, uh, from your processor and things like that separation of data and, and UI and just basic kind of fundamentals, um, not allocating in your, audio callback. Um, those are the things that they look for. And like I said, curiosity to learn more than anything, just curiosity to digest new information. I would also, and we are kind of derailing the conversation completely, but I think it's <laughs> maybe just, just interesting for, for people because these questions can, can come like up every single time, right? We have this meetup where like people are like, how do I, how do I get a job or what are you looking for and this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I think uh, probably there's also like a level of like cross pollination if you have like other background, which is kind of not necessarily building an audio plugin, but there's some overlap with that. Mm -hmm. I think that's also like really useful because, for example, speaking about myself, when I got my first job as a software developer at Native Instruments, which was when 10 years ago now, um, I had certainly not written a plugin before. I, I was doing like astrophysics, like numerical simulations, which is something completely different, but I knew some C and I knew some in some other context where you have to like churn numbers and do things like that. And I did really care about music and I was really interested. And I think, so that was for me enough to get that job. And I think it's, it's just, you know, for other people as well, maybe interesting that there are always other ways to get into it. If you have like other, you know, relevant knowledge, which kind of touches upon audio, which you can reuse maybe, and you just kind of show that passion. Yeah. That's also kind of a way into the industry, I would say, or at least it used to be. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely not, a one way to go. Uh, you know, like you said, like if I, if I saw your CV back uh, way back when, and I saw that you were an astrophysicist and you knew some C++, I would probably think this person probably can learn on the job. Like coding plugins will probably be a breeze to, <laughs> it would probably be a breeze to, uh, to somebody that could do astrophysics. And uh, but people have all kinds of interesting backgrounds. Like one of yeah. my colleagues has a degree in history and you know, he's an amazing developer, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely, and and uh, and music as well. Sometimes just understanding what the user wants. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. It, I think it would be quite difficult to be a, an effective plugin developer if you didn't actually produce music. I mean, I know that there are people out there that do it, but uh, I, I think that uh, there's definitely a certain experience that you get from creating music, being a musician. You have to have. I'm a strong believer that you probably have to have some sort of base knowledge or base interest even in, uh, in music, how music works, uh, music production, um, you know. Yeah, I think music. that's the uniting factor, right? So, you know, Chris, you mentioned you learned the violin and then the cello and then Mark, I see like a beautiful PRS guitar behind you. And, you know, I also was, you know, when I was applying for that job, I had spent like years making music and playing in bands and, you know, playing around with guitar rake, which is the reason why I wanted to go to NI, right? And yeah. things like that. So I think this is maybe like a uniting force that we all just really yeah. like music and audio and sound and, and that, you know. Yeah, and not to segue too far from the conversation, yeah. but um, another, another thing, another common question that we get is, well, what do I build? You know, what, what do I build? And uh, one way that, just kind of catapulting off of what Timur was saying is that if you played the violin, for instance, you would probably have some, some type of uh, intimate knowledge about how strings work, how strings resonate, how about music theory. So use that, use what, use that experience that you have, whether it's physics or whether it's uh, whether it's playing an instrument or whether it's producing music and build, try to build something around that, try to build something around that base knowledge that you have. And because you're going to likely know more about that particular side of uh, side of things than the average person. So that, that would be the place to start. Like I know more about DJing, um, than the average person for sure. So one of the first apps that I built was a piece of DJ software. 
Uh, so you know how the, the how a person would want to use that software and so on. So that's kind of that was kind of my starting point. Um, yeah. So, anyways, let's get back to Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have two more questions for you, Chris. Yeah. Well, I, hold on. I want to make a couple comments on what you yeah, guys yeah, are yeah, just yeah. saying, just to yeah. like re- reinforce what Josh said about yeah. well, about building something. I would say it's also like don't get hung up on you know like it, when I'm interviewing somebody or looking for somebody. Um, I almost don't really care what like technical choices they made. I mean, I do care a little bit if they made really bad technical choices, that's a red flag. But um, the, the fact that you chose to build something is what matters most. Like it doesn't really matter. The details didn't really matter. The fact that you took the initiative to build something and then also, you know, about what to build. Um, yeah. It's just like, well, what are you interested in? Like, what do you want? Like, yeah. you know, and that will come through on its own. So if you say like, oh man, like, um, like when I was at Miami, um, I made a synth because I love synths and like, it just, it was just fun. That was just what I was interested in. So I just wanted to know how it worked. I wanted to see how it would sound if I tried to make one. So. Yeah. Great. Um, I did have one question before we got to the last two questions um, that I forgot to ask earlier. Uh, so, so Sound Toys is a uh, is a smaller company, and of course, uh, there are a lot more plugin companies that are out uh, releasing plugins now. What do you feel that the company has had to had to adjust uh, as as a whole in terms of? Uh, saying, okay, well, there are a lot more competitors in this space and now we need to pivot in a certain direction? Or do you feel that you've established, as a company that you've established that identity and that you can say, we are who we are and this is what we do and we're going to continue to bear down this path? And like, for instance, have you thought about branching out to, let's say, iOS apps or anything like that, um, or like going in different directions, building a virtual instrument, or has it always been, okay, we're going to, we're an effects company and that's what we're going to do. And that's what we're going to, that's our bread and butter. Uh, I think, you know, as far as iOS apps or instruments, like we've of course talked about doing all of those things. Um, But in terms of like uh, how the plugin like market has changed, you know, over the years and there being so many more people, like, um, I'm not sure it's really affected much, um, in terms of how we approach things. Um, I don't think it's, it really matters because I think everyone has their own unique perspective. It only matters if you don't have a unique perspective, then it matters that there's a lot of other people around. But if you do have a unique perspective, then um, it, it sort of, you know, it sort of doesn't matter. And I, I feel like, you know, we do have our own unique um, take on things and our own unique approach, so. Amazing. Uh, Timur, got some more questions for us? Yeah, so, so one is, I think you've kind of answered in your talk, but I'm just gonna, for completeness sake, uh, repeat the question. It's from uh, Monty Music Channel asking, did you write your own API on top of the Steinberg VST SDK or do you use Juice or do you write separate for all plugin formats? And I guess from what I remember, it's kind of neither of those, right? You have like your own API that you wrote before you actually put VST underneath it, right? Yeah, so there's kind of like a platform independent format, like an abstraction of like, this is a plugin. And then um, you have, um, you know, basically wrappers are around that for VST. AAX and um, audio units, you know, that just translate between like the different ways of like, how do you get a parameter value? How do you identify a parameter? How do you, you know, declare what parameters are automatable and which ones aren't, you know, um, where does, um, how does MIDI come in? How do, you know, all those types of things, Uh which are just like, all just slightly different between AU VST and AAX and, um, and yeah. So there's kind of like a core, a core center and then there's just like interfaces that you know interpret between you know what a VST host wants to see versus what an audio unit host wants to see. Yeah, it sounds very similar to like the equivalent library at Native Instruments that at some point I was the maintainer of when I was there, and it sounds very similar to kind of what Juice is doing in the end. I think you just if you want to do cross-platform and cross plugin formats, I guess you just end up kind of writing something like that, which is probably going to look fairly similar everywhere at all of those companies, I would 
say probably exactly yeah yeah and then the same thing for you know you're talking about cross-platform like you know um you have a some type of file api you know which has different implementations for mac and when has a little interpretation for mac and a little interpretation for windows well actually since c 17 we do have std file system for that but i guess in the audio industry not many people use that because they already had solutions like a decade before this thing you right know, yeah the standard so yeah, that's the trick. Like if you already have a solution, yeah. like even if the new solution is great, it's more work to move to the new solution exactly. only to get what you already had, which is working code, you yeah, know? Exactly. And it's not more, just more work, but also you have to retest everything. You have to like, yeah, without right, exactly. actually getting any value for the end user. Right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, it sounds like uh, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. Um, right, so that brings me to the last question by Kay Cranberry, who's asking, when will the big plate be released? Uh, I can't answer that question. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, again, like I'll just point back to like the high bar for things and like uh, it'll be ready when it's ready. Um, there's been <laughs> like a lot of work put into it. I think at some companies, you know, it might've been yeah, uh, released already, but um, but we do, you know, we go to the beat of our own drum and and might take things in a different direction than people expect. So, um, but we'll see. You know, I don't, I don't know. I can't say how that's all going to play out. So, well, we're going to be, um, I guess, watching carefully and looking forward to it if and when it happens. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. With that, um, we don't have any more questions on the chat unless you want to very, very quickly write something now or let me know that I forgot something, uh, which doesn't seem to be the case. I was, I was interested to ask Chris um, whether you have to do any trade-offs of CPU usage versus your ideal algorithm, DSP algorithm that you want to write and how do you, how do you make that trade-off? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think those trade-offs, the, the line where that trade-off exists has changed over time, which is a challenge, right? So if you have a, um, a product that you designed like a long time ago, you know, like there might've been like certain considerations for CPU that where you might be able to make it sound even a lot better now. Um, yeah, we definitely run into that. And I think even if you know, with computers being so fast, you have to consider that you're not the only plugin in someone's session, or they might have 20 copies of you, 20 instances, you know, in their session. So, um, you know, optimization is, yeah, it's still, it, there's still limitations to work with, you know. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, it looks like that's all the questions that we have from the chat as well. Thank you so much, Chris, for, for sharing that with us. I oh, appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, thank you very much. That was definitely a very, very interesting session. Thank you so much for like sharing, very generously sharing. Cool. Yeah, you're welcome. It was, it was fun. <laughs>